Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And Fallout 4's post-nuclear wasteland we get to explore is filled with no shortage of quests, activities, and adventures to keep the sole survivor busy as they venture across the land that was once known as the US of A. However, three years later, perhaps some vault dwellers may finally be beginning to feel as though they've done it all, explored every location, defeated every enemy, and, dare I say, helped every settlement and are now left to wonder if there's anything left to do in this dystopian world. Well, my dear hypothetical question asker, the answer is yes. Hopefully. Kick back and relax as we dive into five things you probably never knew you could do in Fallout 4. Starting off, Long Neck Lukowski's is an old pre-war meatpacking plant that thankfully didn't suffer too hard when the bombs fell. Not too long ago, a handyman named Theodore Collins stumbled upon the place, and with some good tinkering, was actually able to restore most of the place's equipment and Mr. Handy's, making the factory operational once again. From there, he was able to strike deals with many of the Commonwealth's hunters and traders to provide him with fresh meat on a frequent basis, which he would then package in his factory and proceed to sell at a profit. At face value, this seems to be quite the success story. A man making an honest living for himself by providing his community with a service they need. What's not to love? Especially in a world like this, where most business isn't quite so clean. Alas, recently Theodore stumbled upon some problems. When you first enter the cannery, you'll walk in on him in the middle of a brutal argument with the merchant. Apparently his meat has recently been making her customers sick and now she's refusing to sell it. The entrepreneurial man will insult her, and the trader will walk out in frustration. When spoken to and asked what that whole scene was about, Mr. Collins will assure you that it was nothing. His meat's not making people sick. That merchant just wanted a better deal. She'll be back very soon. But if you press the matter, the player can demand to be allowed to inspect the factory to verify these claims. Theodore will reluctantly agree. He just asks that you stay out of the basement. It's, uh, dangerous down there. This will begin the quest, Mystery Meat, which immediately sends you to go check out the factory's basement. Long story short, down there you'll discover that Theodore has recently been forced to resort to putting feral ghoul meat in his cans due to a high demand. This is what's making people sick. As you exit the basement with this knowledge, Collins will confront you from a platform, saying that now you know his secret, he has to murder you to death, and will turn hostile. Simply defeat him in combat, and the quest will be completed. However, what you may not have known is that there's an alternative ending to this mission that doesn't involve any bloodshed. If when Theodore turns hostile, rather than return his fire, you instead quickly approach him, this will be difficult to do as he's on a very hard to reach platform, but once you've closed enough distance with him, the man will stop shooting and instead cower, begging you to spare him. He'll promise that if you just leave him alone and keep quiet, he'll give you a split of his profits. If you decline, Collins will just open fire again out of desperation. But if you accept, he'll give you a few hundred caps straight away, and every few days you can come back to the cannery and collect a few hundred more, essentially earning you an entire new source of permanent income. Oh, oh, hey look, 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 it, it doesn't have to be this way. Look, well, we can run this place together. You look the other way, and I'll give you a cut of the profits. So, if you're willing to exercise just a bit of restraint, quite an opportunity awaits the sole survivor. Next on our list, very early in the game, you'll be introduced to Preston Garvey and his small gang of survivors as they're being besieged by raiders within the Museum of Freedom in Concord. After overpowering their attackers and personally speaking with the group, Preston will reveal that yet another wave of attackers is on their way. But one of the pack's members, a mechanic named Sturges, has a plan on how to deal with them. A set of power armor near Crashed Vertebird on the roof can be reactivated if you're able to break a lock downstairs and take the fusion core in the generator that's currently powering the building. Sturges will have you secure that core, put it in the armor, rip off the minigun that's attached to the Vertebird, and use your new kit to push back the raider menaces. This should serve as your introduction to Fallout 4's whole new power armor system. And for most of us, will give us access to the first set of a playthrough. But if prior to linking up with Preston's group for the first time, you've already somehow secured another set of power armor and are wearing it when you do so, Sturge's dialogue will change, this time acknowledging that you sort of beat him to the punch. And bonus points if you also already have a minigun in your inventory, because that will allow for even more additional extra dialogue. 
Sturgis, tell him. I had a whole fancy plan about fixing up a suit of power armor, and here you are, walking in like some kind of metal miracle. There's a crashed vertebrate up on the roof. Old school, pre-war. You might have seen it. Well, it's got a minigun, and it seems to be intact. Wearing that armor, you could rip it right off. Then those raiders get an express ticket to hell. You dig? Actually, I got a minigun right here. We're set. Well, all right. Maybe our luck's finally turning around. Coming in at number three, the Pillars of the Community are a strange cult-like organization operating in the Charles View Amphitheater. They're led by a charismatic leader with a randomly generated name, who requests all his followers give him everything they own to, quote, release their dependency on material possessions, or something. If you play your cards right, or wrong, you can even end up giving him every single item in your inventory, but that's neither here nor there. During the Cabot House quest, Emogene Takes a Lover, you'll have to find a young girl named Emogene, who ran off to be with this con man of a cult leader and bring her home. Now, once Emogene Takes a Lover has begun, whoever was previously leading the pillars of the community will be replaced with a character named Brother Thomas. He'll spawn in even if the last guy died. Thomas is effectively the same NPC, with the same interactions, you can give him all your things too, and a similar appearance. But you'll have to convince him to release Emma Jean, either with your words or combat abilities, to complete the quest. Now, the funny thing here is, that if prior to beginning this quest and meeting Brother Thomas, you slay the last randomly generated leader, some unique dialogue will be unlocked when you demand that Thomas release Emma Jean, specifically when you use the threaten option. Take a listen. She's not seeing anybody until she cools off. I killed the last guy who was running this scam, in case that matters to you. Uh, good, good to know. Let me just unlock the door for you, okay? For fourth spot, Confidence Man is another side quest. This one centers around Travis Miles, DJ of Diamond City Radio. As its name may hint, this mission focuses around Travis's horrible lack of confidence and self-esteem. He speaks softly when on air, and often seems quite shy. According to the owners of the Dugout Inn, Diamond City's largest pub and motel, the Bobra Brothers, this is a problem. They play DCR in their restaurant, and Travis's weak tone is boring their customers. So they'll enlist the Vault Dweller's help in a plan they've devised to turn Travis's attitude around, and make him truly believe in himself. Maybe after that, he'll finally be entertaining. They've hired two strongmen to harass the DJ the next time he comes into their business. Your job will be to encourage Travis to stand up for himself and fight the bullies. With you at his side, the brothers reason Mr. Miles might actually go for it. Now, of course, the strongmen have also been paid to lose the ensuing fight as well, so there's no real risk. Once you've agreed, simply wait around for Travis to show up and be approached by the bullies, and the faux conflict can begin. Encourage Travis to stand up for himself by promising to help, and Diamond City Radio's host will indeed agree to fight, and a short brawl will break out between both parties. As the assailants have already been paid to lose, you can imagine this engagement won't be particularly difficult at all. Both attackers have incredibly low stats, and honestly, you don't even need to do much. Travis has got this. After the fight is over, you'll be thanked by our new slugger of a friend, who will seem pretty proud of himself, and the quest will move on. However, despite how insanely easy it is to win the fight, I mean, you literally don't have to do anything, it is indeed technically possible for Travis to lose if you want to make that happen. Again, Travis has high enough stats to take on both men at once. But, if you hit him a few times to lower his HP and let the bullies gang up on him, he can be defeated. After this happens, the victorious bullies will simply walk out, and Travis will say some unique lines of dialogue. Travis. Oh, jeez. I am so, so sorry. I mean, I don't want to say I told you, but... Uh, I kind of told you it would end up like this. Look on the bright side. They're not bothering you now. Yeah, I guess. I'm gonna go now, but, uh, thanks. Thanks for, you know, sticking up for me. The remainder of the quest will go on as normal, and eventually he can still find his confidence. But if you're feeling a bit devious, this is an option.
And finally, last on our list, similar to the spot where we mentioned it's possible to unlock some special conversations in your first meeting with Preston by already arriving in power armor, if you successfully find out what happened to Sean, before you make contact with Codsworth or Preston Garvey, which, believe it or not, is very possible so long as you avoid both Sanctuary and Concord at the start of your game, and head straight to Diamond City. Go this route, take care of the Institute first, or at very least, discover they're responsible for your son's disappearance, and when you do finally make your way back to Concord and Sanctuary for the first time to meet with Preston and Codsworth, some new dialogue will be available that enable you to inform your old robot companion the true facts of Sean's disappearance and only further Preston's hatred of the organization after telling him that they're responsible for Sean. Uh, and young Sean? What of your son? Have you heard of the Institute? Hmm, can't say I have. News is a bit hard to come by these days. What with the lack of luncheons and no more GNN. He's with his mother. Sir, this news, I never imagined our reunion to be... Quite like this. My son. The Institute kidnapped him when I was still trapped. But I found him now. Oh, hell. I've heard some bad things about the Institute. But kidnapping babies now? Damn. Out of all the ones featured in this video, I definitely found this one to be the coolest, as despite how almost forced it is upon you to meet with Codsworth and Preston early in game, Bethesda did indeed make some contingency plans just in case you didn't. Who needs Brother Thomas when you have Lord Todd? And with that, we are going to wrap up. Five things you probably never knew you could do in Fallout 4. Thanks for stopping by, everyone. Which of the ones mentioned were you already familiar with? And which did you find to be the coolest? What hidden choices and options do you know of that I've yet to tackle? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Thanks for stopping by, and hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everybody.